Well, good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm 62. This is where we will be spending the majority of our time this morning. Um, I am incredibly excited and humbled for this opportunity to dive into God's Word with you uh, this morning. If you are here this morning and you do not have a Bible, no worries. You can find one if you want to read along in the chair racks in front of you. And if you're using one of these Bibles, you can find Psalm 62 on page 479. Um, if you brought your own, can't help you with where it's at, you're going to have to find that one. I think that it is certain in our lives that we will face trouble. That things in our lives will at some Thank you. 
get for comfort in this situation. Now he turns to the Lord. The only strong refuge. So let's look at this together. There's some 62 verse 1. It says, For God It mode. I would much more likely hit the panic button and run around like a crazy man. <laughs> that is my disposition, is that I am, I am a fixer, and when things go wrong, I want, I want to fix it as quickly as possible <laughs> so that I stress as little as possible. And that inevitably leads me to stress more. Um, so then what does it mean to be silent? That was what I was thinking about as I was preparing this. And I think for starters, we have to look at what it doesn't mean. And it does not mean sitting on the couch and doing nothing. Is that being silent is not a literal shutting down of the mind silence. Sanctification in any form is not a passive process. D.A. Carson has a great quote. He says, people do not drift towards holiness. We slouch toward prayer prayerlessness. And we delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. What a fantastic quote. And so many times I think that we get to this place. We try not to be controlling and we overcompensate into laziness. We try to take our hands off the wheel and we end up passed out in the back seat. But in the same way that our sanctification is not passive, learning to wait silently for God is an active thing. It is something that we have to put time into to learn how to do. I think the best example of this is Jesus himself. 
is that we see in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, that Jesus is in agony. That he is in, it is the night before his crucifixion, he is in the garden with his disciples, and he is most certainly being oppressed. And he knows what is coming. They are coming to arrest him, and the time to fulfill his Father's will is coming near. And so what does Jesus do? Well, he does not go into fix-it mode. He does not hit the panic button. And he most certainly does not shut down. So let's look together at how he reacts. Uh, Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch, over with, or you could not watch with me one hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. We see here that three times Jesus goes to God, asking him to let this pass him by. Knowing the agony that is to come, he does not run, but he goes to his Father. But at the end of the day, Christ is not asking that he necessarily be liberated, but that his will be aligned to that of the Father's. Because Christ knows what has to be done. And he does not want to run, but he wants to be faithful to the God that he knows. The God that he is. And so for, the, for us, who are not Jesus, what does this look like? I would argue that for us to wait silently for God is to meditate on the truth of who he is, acknowledging that he is faithful. I'll say that again, that I would argue for us to wait silently for God is to meditate on the truth of who he is, acknowledging that he is faithful. Waiting silently for God involves most definitely reading your Bible and praying while we wait. Because if we want to hear from God and we want consolation from him, then there is no better place to look than scripture to look through the whole Bible and see all of the things that were promised and then see all of the promises that were fulfilled. Every single one of them. And then to know that when he promises that he will be with us and that he is coming back again, that he will be faithful to that. Not because of us, but because of who he is and how he has been faithful in the past. No better place to be reminded of who he is and what he's done for us. No better place. And the goal of waiting silently is then not to receive some secret word from God that is going to fix our situation. Because we take that posture, right? We, we like to think that some magic word from heaven is going to come down and it's going to fix everything. But no, we the goal of waiting silently is then to receive consolation with our entire being that the Lord is sufficient in times of trouble and out. That is the goal, is to recognize that God has been faithful in the past and he will be faithful now and that he is all that we need. And so now having examined just who God is and 
the posture in which we are to wait. We move into question three. So when are we to wait? If we know we are to wait for God and we are to wait silently and patiently, then when are we to wait? And the answer to that, again, seems kind of obvious. Like we are to wait in times of trouble. That that is what the psalm is posing to us. It seems like it's almost too easy of an answer because obviously David is in some kind of trouble here. And he's waiting for God during that. It would be really easy to say, boom, end of story. That's all that is here. However, I think that the argument can be made that while the psalm is only focusing on David's time of trouble, is that we also are to wait for God in the times of calm. In fact, I would argue that if we do not patiently wait for God in the calm times, then when calamity comes, we will fail to be prepared. Is that if we do not learn to wait and look for God when things are good, we will most certainly not look for him when things get bad. We recognize that this is the way it works in every other area of life. Right? If you fail to study for a test, the moment that that test comes, you're going to fail the test. I've taken enough tests to know that. I've not studied for enough tests to know that. If you never practice a sport and game time comes, you will most certainly strike out or fumble or miss the shot. Whatever sport you want to think of, this rings true. Professional athletes college athletes, high school athletes, even like t-ball level athletes, right? Like we know that practice is necessary to effectively perform at game time. We know this. If you're going to a concert and the band has not spent hours upon hours practicing their songs beforehand, you're going to be severely disappointed. I tried to play guitar for a minute when I was a kid. Hated practice, was not good at guitar. <laughs> I have never met anyone who picked up a guitar and was Jimi Hendrix. It takes hours upon hours of practice. I could go on and on. And so why then do we expect practice and preparation in every part of our lives except for our spiritual lives? Why do we expect that we can neglect meaningful time with God and still believe that in the times of trouble we will miraculously remember who He is and what He has done for us? If our hearts are not pulled to remembering Him in the times of good and calm, they will most certainly forget Him when it's game time. Whether it be sin or opposition, if we have not meditated on who God is and what he has done, we will not remember him when the time comes. Rather, we will focus on what is going wrong instead of God. Or we will focus on our ability to fix the situation, probably making things worse. We must day in and day out preach the truth of God's word to ourselves. We must let it seep down into our bones in the times of the calm so that we can be fortified in the times of the storm. We must build those walls thick because God is a fortress so that when the wind blows, it will not topple over. Final question. Why then can we have confidence in our waiting? Why? Why can we know that confidence and waiting silently for God is the right move? And to this again, I think we turn our attention to the character of God. David, at the end of this psalm, outlines three primary attributes of God. He outlines his power, he outlines his love, and he outlines his justice. He says, for once I have spoken, and twice I have heard this, the power belongs to God. That to you, O oh Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his works. The power belongs to God. The power is not in the hands of those that are opposing you. The power is not 
in the hands of the evil one that is tempting you. And the power is most certainly not in your hands. No, the power belongs to God, the all-powerful creator of the universe who created everything with his mere voice, whose power has absolutely and indefinitely no end. His enemies do not even stand a chance. This is the power of our God. And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. Not only is God powerful, but he is also loving. And how do we know that love? The Bible tells us that we know that love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we were separated from God because of our sin, and he would have had every right to leave us this way. But instead, he chose to take our punishment into, our, into himself and crucify it on a cross. All the wrath and all the suffering that should have been ours was poured out onto Jesus for the purpose of us being made right with God and him being glorified. Not because we deserved it. Not because we are amazing and God needed us. Not because he couldn't possibly live without us, but because he is a merciful, gracious, and loving God who has been so, so good to us. And finally, justice. For you will render to a man according to his work. We can have confidence in God because at the end of the day, no injustice will go unpunished. Because we know that God is a God of perfect justice that whether in this life or the next life, that justice will come. And the justice that we experience in this life is just a small picture of the perfect justice that is displayed by God and will one day be displayed by God. That he has given us a snapshot of what that day will be like. That is for this reason that we can be confident that if wrong is being done, justice will prevail. If not now, then in eternity. And if you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, then in your current state, this is not good news for you. The Bible tells us in Romans 2, 6 through 11, it expands on this idea. It says, He will render to each one according to his works. Paul quotes this psalm and then goes on to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first but also the Greek but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, and the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. And let me just tell you this morning that there are none who in well-doing have sought glory and honor and immortality. That none of us have found ourselves on that side of the line. The Bible tells us that there are none that do good, we have all bowed down to unrighteousness and disobedience, and the punishment for this is eternal torment separated from God. That even our good works are worth as much as dirty rags when it comes to paying our debt for these transgressions. So if you were hoping this morning that the one who renders to each according to your works would count your good works and render to you Eternity with him, you are mistaken. Because your good works are in fact not as good as you thought they were. They flow from a corrupt and broken heart. But this is not hopeless. If the story stopped there, we would all be up the creek without a paddle. But it doesn't. Because God in his steadfast love, as I said before, took on human form. He came to earth as Jesus. He lived the perfect life to die the death that was reserved for us. And that this morning, all of the punishment that was due to you and to me has been 
taken on to himself. He died in our place. And then he rose again, securing our salvation. And if you trust in this sacrifice this morning, then you can be united to Christ. That when God looks at you, he will not see your unrighteousness. He will not see you on that side of the line. Rather, he will see the good and perfect nature of his son whom he loves. And that by uniting with Jesus, we now find ourselves in his favor. It is this act that we see God offer to you this morning and and that he offered to us the ultimate act of refuge in himself. We talk about God as a refuge and a fortress. And the ultimate act of refuge that we have seen from God is offering us refuge from his wrath. And the only place that that is found is in Jesus Christ. So I pose a final question this morning. What what false refuge is God calling you to turn from this morning? What false refuge have you built up in your heart that you think is sufficient, that God needs to tear down. Maybe it's your own ability. Maybe it's your charisma, your critical thinking skills, your problem solving ability. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe you've placed too much hope in the wealth that you have accumulated. Whatever it may be, every single one of these things will fail you. And as we have examined in Psalm 62 this morning, we see that in times of trouble, we are not to wait on ourselves or any other worldly power for help. No, we are in times of trouble. Our souls are to wait silently and patiently for God because it is to him that belong power and love and justice. Let's pray.